you know, there are a lot of things we could say about living in this current age, about why it's bad and scary and horrible, um, but we can't deny that we are living in the golden age of sparkling water. And um, I have this one, which is vanilla cherry soda, which you can't see, but it's like a President's Choice brand. And it tastes exactly like vanilla cherry Coke, and it's so good. And if this is the only good thing we have, then I'm gonna cling to it. Hello Bibliophiles, my name is Jill, and I'm going to do a video today inspired largely by Jack Edwards. I've been watching a lot of his channel recently, his channel and his second channel, and I just think he's so charming and sweet, and um, you know, we have very different styles and different um, goals with our YouTube channels, and um, like normally I don't watch a lot of people's videos who have different tastes than me, that's actually not true at all, I just completely lied. I watch a lot of people who have very different tastes than me, um, but I just really admire Jack. I think that he's like really sweet and I think he's like, you know, going, like I just love what he's done with his channel. I think he's great. And so from, from a motherly figure, Jack, uh, you're very sweet and charming and I wish you all the best. But he did a video recently where he went through all the ranking, like all of his Goodreads stars, um, all the books he's read all year. I think he like reacted to the rankings. I think he went from like the worst to the best. So I'm gonna do the same in this video here today. I've talked about most of these already on my channel. So if I have, I will link you to the videos where I've talked about them. Um, but there are some that I haven't talked about that I'd like to just mention at least um, on this channel. I'll have a little disclaimer here, the usual one. If you disagree with my ranking, um, you're welcome to that. And I'm glad that you have a different opinion than me and please share it. I would love to know why you disagree with me um, on, or you know, if I hate a book and you love it, tell me why, I would love to know. Um, but also, I don't, I don't really care <laughs> if you, like, I don't care if you're upset about it. Like, if you're upset about it, I'm sorry, but also it's just, you know, personal taste, get over it, you know? I have read 41 books this year, but I'm gonna take one of them out and that's that pamphlet I read by John Cracker, which I've talked about a couple of times called Three Cups of Deceit. And uh, it honestly, it's just a long form essay and I just have no real strong feelings about it either way. So I'm just not gonna put it on this list. It just feels like a moot point. So uh, let's go through this list. One is the worst again, 40 is the best. And I'll be honest with you, I have liked almost everything I've read this year for the most part, like there's some real duds, but there are some mostly pretty good books. So between like, like, between like number 10 and 30, they're just like, great you know good reads i enjoyed them um the ranking could move back and forth so i'm not super solid in that middle section but i am quite confident about my top 10 and my worst five <laughs> so um let's get started i have my computer here so if i look down that's what i'm looking at um the worst book that i read this year hands down is the snow line by tessa mcwatt oh my god i hate this book and the more time i have away from that book the more egregious it feels i have already talked about that book in another video and i also did um a pretty scathing review on my instagram about that book so if you want to know more you can go and check it out there but basically uh this book is pitched as being this adventure between four on likely companions who are all in India for a wedding and what it actually is is this kind of really boring story of this old white man who is um, ill and his wife has died and for some inexplicable reason he's brought his wife's ashes to India to scatter which is nonsensical because she's not Indian and she's never lived in India and the connection to India is just his not his wife's so it's a really weird plot point from what I remember um, and also he's just an he's insufferable human and the other three people who are supposed to be part of this like four, you know, unlikely companions, it really is only about this other girl, Rima, who is, again, her plot point is extremely boring. She's just a woman who is pregnant, like, which is also like supposed to be a twist, but like, it's so obvious from the very beginning that she's pregnant. So, you know, <laughs> not well hidden. Um, and then the, the father is someone she doesn't love as much as he loves her. <laughs> what a sad story. Anyway, it's a, it's a terrible book. The writing is, like so dense, it's like obscures any plot, like obscures any of the plot or any of the character development. It's really difficult to read. I found it um, like just geographically confusing. The whole thing was, was bad. It was bad, don't read it, it's bad. Second worst of the whole year is The Employees by Olga Ravin. Translator I think is Martin Aiken. And if I remember that, congratulations to me. Like <laughs> what a success. I want to make it very clear that I don't necessarily think this book is terrible. I think it was a terrible choice for me to pick up this book because it is, first of all, it's like a novella and I don't normally get along super well with novellas, not usually. Um, also it is <laughs> written in vignettes. and I really don't like vignettes. Just not, it did not work for me at all. I think the premise is kind of cool. It's like they're trying to grow humans and like take care. Of, I think that's what the premise is. I can't even really remember. 
Um, but I remember just it had no payoff for me at all. Uh, and I know a lot of people just like, lots of people disagree with me, lots of people love this book, and it's, I really think in this case it's just like, it is not the book for me. Um, but you may love it, and that's good for you. Um, my third worst book of the year is Blueberries by Elena Savage, and sorry to my friend Maria who loves this book. I think if I had read this book before I read Sarah Polly's book of essays, which, spoiler alert, is one of my best books of the year, um, I think I would have a different feeling about it, but because I read it after and because it became so obvious to me how, um, how effortful this book is. So it's a collection of essays about the author's experience with trauma, like, you know, in, in different forms. Um, and I think what it was really praised for is kind of the format of the book, the form of the book, because the essays all kind of, this is the thing is like, I don't, I don't know if we should be praising form <laughs> if it like doesn't make the book any more enjoyable. Like, to me, the format of these essays, it just was irritating. Like, it just kind of, the way it's formatted on the page oftentimes, like, it's kind of like poetry sometimes where, you know, stanzas will jump back and forth on the page visually or like, um, I remember one there was like a uh, toll kind of in, in sections, like in vignettes, and that's not new. That's like, lots of people write like that. Another one is told like, uh, there are two essays side by side and she's like, kind of like reflecting on her feelings about one of the essays. Um, Again, I don't think that's revolutionary. Other people have done that already. Um, and the reason I think this book was really unsuccessful for me personally was I think that it was so obvious to me that she wasn't, that this was an effort for her to process her trauma, um, but it still felt like she was showing off. Like it felt like she was saying, look how good of a writer I am. Look how, look how I can spin words. I felt like as a reader, I was being held back by a very clear lack of vulnerability on the author's part. And some people might like that, but it just didn't work for me, especially after reading another essay that was just like so much more superior, uh, talking about similar things. I just, I, yeah, it didn't work for me at all. Um, sorry to everyone, especially Maria. <laughs> um, next we have The Cult of We, which is a book about we work and Adam Newman. It pitches itself as a book about how the cult-like community of we work, which is like this, um, you know, office space rental company and how Adam Newman became this like, tech startup guy who, um, just a, like a megal megalomaniac really, like a, a person just in search of, desperate search of money, and then his partners who also like really wanted to make a lot of money. And I just felt like the book did not make a strong enough case for why it was cult-like. And I say that as someone who's read a lot of books about cults, and um, I kind of was waiting for kind of like the weirdness and stuff to, to, to kind of slide in, and I was like, this just sounds like any group I've ever been part of. Like, nothing about this is particularly, um, deserves this title of cult like more than something else and I just thought they didn't make a strong enough case. Maybe this is actually a commentary on our current culture like everything feels a bit cult like because we have we have to be so invested in things and I don't know that's a different thought process for a different day perhaps um but it just wasn't it just didn't deliver for me at all and also it was extremely extremely over detailed just too much information that I didn't need and it could have been infinitely shorter and also I think as a story like the story of we work isn't I just didn't find it interesting. Book number five is one I haven't talked about. It's called To the Friend Who Did Not Save My Life by Hervé Guibert, which is translated from the French. It's a book that um, I bought because it was on like a best of books of 2020, maybe, um, from the New York Times. The way this was kind of pitched was that it's a story of uh, the final days of Michel Foucault as he died of AIDS. And um, the author was actually friends with Michel Foucault. And I've talked about before in some videos how I like my love Foucault and I spent a lot of time reading a lot of his work in university and I had I wrote like my final paper in university was a love letter to Foucault so I thought I had to read this and I think uh, for, because it's a it's a book that the author is is French uh from France and it was um I don't I can't remember if it was written in the 80s it must not have been written in the 80s I can't remember the details but it felt a bit dated to me like just in terms of the writing style and the format it might also be the translation from French. It does have a very French feel about the writing, almost the same kind of style of writing that Foucault has, um, which feels like I think perhaps it felt a bit difficult to read, like I was reading uh, like philosophy or like criticism or something like this, which is something that I wasn't really prepared for in that particular book. And there was something about the way that each section was written because it was kind of told in like letters and like diary entries is kind of how it read. And I generally don't like letters and diary entries as a, just as a format. And I found it dragged a lot. There was a lot of stuff that could have been chopped out because the 
the point of the story I realized at the end was that um, the main character who actually is based on the author himself um, also has AIDS and he's um, desperately trying to get access to medication that's available in the states but not in France and he has a friend who he thinks would help him and, and won't help him hence the friend who will not save my or did not save my life um and I th thought that like I actually kind of miss that that was the point by the way this was written I don't know if it's translation or if it's just like the headspace I was in reading it like I don't know if this is the book's fault more is that it's just again like it's not a great match so you know I know other people who love Hervé Guibert as a writer and I wouldn't not read some of his other books but I do think that I probably read it at the wrong time and probably wasn't really the right choice for me so that's my my fifth worst book of the year my next one is How High We Go in the Dark by Sequoia Nagamatsu I think is the author's name and this one I really I was disappointed by I was I thought for sure I was gonna like this book um, even though Kayla from Books and Lala loved it and if she loves it normally I hate it <laughs> but um, I don't know why I thought this was going to be like a huge hit for me and I really didn't like this book and I think um, I think it's it's the fault of my expectations perhaps but um, the first chapter of this book is about um, digging in the permafrost in Siberia. These researchers come across uh, you know the remains of uh, a Neanderthal or someone who who lived um, you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago maybe thousands of years ago. I don't understand like history of earth so do not correct me on this I don't care um but like you know forever ago and what they do find is that there's a virus released into the world and um that first kind of section it kind of ends with the virus making people sick in the in the area who find the body there's a couple people who are researchers and they all get sick and then each chapter after that is they're more like short stories because they, they follow um over several years after the virus kind of hits, they call, they call the Alaska virus, and it hits, uh, is it called the Alaska virus? Arctic virus, Arctic virus is what it's called. And it hits, you know, the rest of the world and it mostly affects children and they kind of reflect on that. And I think what I was expecting from this was something much more sci-fi, much more weird, much more, I really wanted more about the actual researchers and I wanted more information about like the process of trying to understand what happened, but there was, it was so focused on like families and children and like the process of like people emotionally processing this virus and because each chapter was actually fairly short ish um or short story and they did some of them connected some of them didn't and i just felt like everything felt unfinished to me the whole story felt like I didn't have enough information about the virus, I didn't have enough information about the people who were affected by it because you didn't get to invest in people long enough. I wanted so much more than what it gave me. Honestly it was just a really average short story collection and the other main problem I had that I think really like really made me uninterested as I was reading is I really got bored you know halfway through this book and I think it's because every single chapter or short story um, in this book has different characters but they all feel exactly the same so the author didn't really make them feel different there was no different voices no different style of writing like everything was exactly the same so i if it, it, it really messes with your brain because you're like i'm supposed to be having a different experience with all these people but it's the writing would suggest that it's the same people so it's yeah i just really didn't like it i struggled with it a lot you know, if you if you're curious about it, go watch Kayla's videos about it because I'm sure that um, she could convince you why it's great. Um, but I did not love it. Book number seven is The Listeners by Jordan Tannehill. This was a book that's uh, the story had a lot of potential, and we read it for my book club and we dis dissected it, and it was really interesting to talk about this book. But as an object, like as an actual novel in and of itself, I didn't like the writing very much. So it's the story of this woman who starts to hear this like low hum that other people cannot, like her family can't hear and starts to like completely infect her life. And then it kind of just destroys her relationships and um, she just can't get it out of her head. And she finds this community of people um, who also can hear it. And then it also involves one of her students and she has a kind of inappropriate relationship with a student that I felt quite uncomfortable about um, for a lot of the novel. And um, I, th I think you're supposed to, but um yeah and I just felt like it's supposed to be like you know a metaphor for a cult I suppose and kind of like for not understanding people who get involved in cults and the kind of connection to cults I, you know it has all that kind of pretty obvious um uh symbolism and imagery and that kind of thing but the writing was was I just thought the writing was really like elementary it just didn't feel like it was very developed writing you know it just that was my main problem is that it just felt really 
very straightforward kind of felt like a grad school thesis it just was not it was not great so that was my problem with the listeners um number eight was intimacies by katie kitamura this was a book i listened to on audio for my book club um i liked it well enough like it's a story about a, a woman who as a translator for um the oh, i can't remember what it's called the human rights court or something in the hague i can't remember what it's called i, I know it's on tip of my tongue but you know what i'm talking about you can look it up. Um, anyway, she's a translator there and it kind of follows her life as a translator, her life in this relationship with this man she meets when she moves to The Hague and then about um, some friendships she has. And I thought it was okay. Like, I think it's a book that, um, that I, like, I think the writing was pretty good. I thought some of the things interested me, interested in me more than, interested me more than others. Um, it's a book that I have already forgotten parts of. So that's kind of why it ranks so low is I just didn't particularly um it didn't stick with me it wasn't a book that I found particularly powerful um but I do think the writing was really good so I would definitely pick up something else from Katie Kitamura number nine is I don't think I talked about this book yet Perfect Sound Whatever by James A. Castor James A. Castor if you don't know is a British comedian who I really really love and this is a book he wrote he had a, his worst year of his life was 2016 and he also says that the best music ever was was made in 2016 released in 2016 and so this book is both a showcase of all his favorite albums or not all of it you know there's hundreds and hundreds of albums released in 2016 but some of his favorite albums from 2016 and he kind of gives a history of them and why he loves them um interspersed with his own kind of personal like narrative of his what happened to him in 2016. I liked this book well enough it was narrated by James E. Castro I listened to an audio I think the best part was when we talked about the albums I have a real problem <laughs> in general with British comedians uh, autobiographies because they all feel like they're written at the wrong time and they all feel a little bit like underwhelming and this kind of also felt like he didn't really commit you know like I, I felt like there's some things that I, I learned a little bit about that I didn't know about before already um if you've watched kind of any of his stand-up or any of his interviews um you've probably heard a lot of the stuff that's in the book already it's fine to listen to I like listening to him narrate it it's nice to read for him to read out his own his own words and some of it was quite funny because he's a funny guy uh, but overall you know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say go out and listen to this book. You'd have to. It's just fine. Book number 10 uh, is The 90s by Chuck Klosterman. This is one of the books I pre-ordered this year. I was really excited about it. And this is, of course, a series of essays about the 90s. And I thought this book was okay. Like, definitely some chapters were more interesting than others. A lot about politics, a lot about music, a lot about movies, um, kind of general pop culture about the 90s itself. Um, my main kind of I don't know if it's a problem like the thing I just didn't love about this book and I didn't why I didn't rave about it was that it just felt a bit recycled from stuff he's written before and just not as good as other stuff. I didn't feel like he was super passionate about this book. I've read a lot of his books I really like him and he usually writes a lot about music that's kind of his his main focus and, all, and other things too but definitely music is like where he has like cut his teeth in his writing career and it did feel to me like he was holding back every chapter from like wanting to talk about music and I wish he'd just written a book about music in the 90s because it would have been probably a lot more interesting, a lot more passionate. This instead felt a bit sterile. It is not the Chuck Klosterman I would recommend. So now we're getting into books that I, you know, generally quite liked. This next book, you're all going to be upset with me for putting Solo <laughs> on my list. But I have his number 11, um, In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado. I listened to this on audio and I have to say, I have not heard a single bad thing about this book ever from anyone. And I feel like everyone has read this on the internet. Um... I think this book like as for what it's doing the work it's doing um to like showcase a same-sex relationship that's abusive uh and I think explaining kind of Carmen Maria Machado explaining her behavior in that relationship and like you know it really just showcased the cycles of abuse and I think like that kind of work is important and I would never say that that is not well done it is I think that like it really showcases um the way you get stuck into these things and and it's hard, like why it's hard to escape abusive relationships and also how it was the part where she, she kind of talks about the history of like how difficult it is to get people to understand that same-sex relationships can be abusive like that was also really important um my problem with this book is that i think the writing is not great like i think that writing feels um a bit cringy actually at times and she makes these kind of metaphors i remember at one point she said um, she was talking about, about a doorknob that fell out of the wall, out of, out, of the, out of the hole on the door. And she talks about how like she had to make it make it find its home again. To me that felt like such a, like a, I don't know if it's childish, but like it's like a, a the, the first go. Like, a, like a, in, in an inexperienced way of writing. I just wasn't impressed with the writing at all. And I felt there was lots of that kind of like 
cringy metaphor, cringy simile that was used in this book that I just really couldn't get past. So subject matter wise, um, the work it's doing like for for um, talking about abusive relationships and 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 showcasing like same-sex violence violent relationships, important. We never take that away. Writing, didn't like it at all. Number 12, I read a romance book. I read The Kiss Quotient by Helen Huang and uh, I think I picked this up because of Jack Edwards actually because he read you know he did a video where he read like seven romance novels and this was the only one that he he described it and I was like oh yeah like this sounds like a premise I could get behind so it's the story of a uh, of a girl who is um, autistic and she uh, doesn't have a lot of experience with sex and relationships and she decides to hire an escort to teach her uh, in order to make her eligible in the, the romance department so that her mother can get off her back and so she can basically can get d date and get married um, so her mother can be happy. I, I don't know how I feel about it. I mean I think it was fine. Like, I read it in a day and I didn't hate it at all but I definitely felt too much insta-love. I just like instantly, instantly they're obsessed with each other and I didn't like that and I, I mean this is why I don't like romance. I'm not the right person to re review romance. I'll say all of it's a bit dumb. Um, the only thing I thought was really effective is when you know, she kind of explains that she um, has autism and you don't really see how that plays out in a, an uncomfortable, awkward situation until she meets his family for the first time. And that scene is so cringy and it is so uncomfortable. And I really felt like, oh, this is a this is smart writing. This is a really good, this really sets the scene. This really develops some interesting conflict. This really showcases why she is uncomfortable and like how she lives in the world. So I, I thought that was really good. And I thought that the rest of the book didn't really <laughs> like do justice to giving her the main character multiple dimensions and stuff and I, I just felt like Michael's only characteristic the love interest of like was that he was hot and like okay I can't take it away from someone <laughs> but also I don't know like romances aren't for me so I thought the steamy scenes were okay there's a lot of them which I wasn't expecting I don't know man like this is also just why this <laughs> is just why I can't read romance I was like none of this feels real at all anyway there you go. I read the romance. Number 13 is Zulika. I read this, I think it was the first book I read this year, which is uh, for a book club. It's set in like the 20s and 30s when they were um, building collective farms in the Soviet Union. And she gets um, very early on her husband, who is very unkind to her, quite cruel actually. Uh, he gets killed and she gets shipped off to like help build this collective farm. And um, it's about her life basically from leaving her home with her husband and, and her mother-in-law. Uh, to then working um, to, the, to the life with these other people who were the Kulaks who were like shipped off to build this collective farm in the middle of Siberia. Uh, and I liked parts of this a lot. I thought the first part was really effective and I by the end I wasn't super into it but I think it's a really interesting... I, I should also say that part of it is because it covers a huge span of time and I, it's too short to do that in my mind. Like I think if you're gonna cover you know like 30 years of someone's life you need a bit more to do that and there's huge sections that are kind of cut out of that story um and i didn't really believe the relationship between her and uh her son as as she gets older so i, I don't know something, i didn't love it but apparently it's based on some true things that happened to the author's grandmother so um i think as a whole i it's really it really really gave a strong sense of place i think that's one thing i love about books in, in the soviet union is that they all feel so strongly of, of a place, um, so I really liked that. It wasn't terrible, just, you know, not a favorite. Next is Beyond Black by Hilary Mantel. This is the story of a woman named, can't remember her name, Allison L. And she is a medium, she speaks to the dead, and she has a business partner named Colette, who is, uh, who Allison needs, because Colette is someone who is organized and she is pushy and she gets things done and Allison cannot do those things because she basically spends a lot of time interacting with the spirit world and some of that is funny and some of that is dark and Allison is really fat she's described constantly as fat and this is this is my main problem with this book because I started reading this book I was like 30 pages in and I was like this is going to be a five-star read this is a new favorite book I love Hilary Mantel's writing. I love the setting. I thought she really shapes these characters out super well. It was funny. It was a little bit spooky and dark. Uh, but also, <laughs> there is so much focus on how fat Allison is in this book. And Colette, her friend, her partner, consistently belittles her, points it out, tries to make her diet, and Allison just lets her do it. There's something to be said about like that relationship being realistic in some ways, but I just... 
I don't like it and you know I think maybe other people would not have a hard time with it but it really was too bad that there was so much focus on how fat Allison was and I felt like it was never addressed that this was abusive abusive language abusive relationships and uh, it was never like outwardly addressed and I just wanted better for Allison so that's my feeling about that book it's a shame um but definitely confirmed to me that I love Hilary Mantel's writing next I have Fearing the Black Body which is the by Sabrina Strings and it's a history of um black bodies uh throughout history in art and um, science and how that has led to fat phobia it's a really interesting book I wish I'd had it when I was in university to read it um I think the reason it's kind of a bit lower on this list is because it's quite an academic text it's not a book that I will refer, like will re recommend to others to read for fun because it's kind of something that you would read if you're curious about uh the history of fat phobia slash you want to do some research on like black bodies in art history throughout Europe and uh with America but well written easy to read number 16 the girl who slept with God by Val Ber Berlinski this was a book I bought because of Rick McDonnell's review because he raved and raved about it and I liked this book a lot I think I think it was really obvious to me that this was a debut novel because it did feel a bit um unwieldy in some parts it definitely could have been cut down a bit to be a bit tighter a bit more of a a, a, a concrete cohesive story um, there are also some things that happen in here, like upon reflection that I'm like, I don't know why that had to happen that way. It was a little bit creepy and unnecessary. Um, but there is some interesting things to be said here about religion and about faith and about how that affects your behavior and your family. Um, there's a, you know, a really interesting story about depression in here and, and how it affects a whole family. Um, yeah, I think it's an interesting book. It's it was I enjoyed reading it. The writing was pretty good. She hasn't written anything else, the author, I don't think. So I would love to see her publish something else that was maybe a bit tighter in terms of narrative. But you know, it was a pretty good book. I have at number 17, The Burning God by R.F. Kuang. This was the third book in the Poppy War trilogy. And um, I liked this book. I think this book of, of the three is my least favorite. It's hard for me to talk about this book because it's the third in the series and I don't want to like spoil a whole lot. This is very much focused on like, you know, the final battle, of course, like every trilogy, especially this is a very, very war focused book. And there's a lot of discussion about strategy, which I actually kind of liked. I thought that was it's something I haven't really read a lot of and I enjoyed it. Um, sometimes I felt like I was like reading a game of Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> which I kind of liked. Um, I think my number one problem with this book, and I've, I'm, I haven't talked about it in depth because I, again, it's the third book in a series and I don't want to spoil anything, but there's like two endings to this book. So there's like, you know, every kind of book that ends in a big battle like has a climax of the battle and then you have the aftermath of the battle. And I felt like this book has this big, you know, this big battle and we have all these, you know, quite emotional things happening. I was like really, you know, I was tugging at my heartstrings toward the end of this big final battle. And then there's this really long period, it's like probably 80 pages after, where she's just talking about the life post-war and how they're rebuilding and I was like oh this is interesting because you don't often see that like the conversation around like the hard work of like how do we rebuild a city how do we build like a democracy um and then there's like the actual ending that comes at the end of it which felt super rushed and totally out of place like it should it should have like not happened or should have there should not have been that middle 80 pages there because I really kind of like you because you lose the momentum there's like a big momentous thing that happens at the end and by that point my emotions had come down and I was not affected at all by the ending and everyone's like oh it'll destroy you it did not destroy me because I did not care so I really think that that like that left a whole star off the book for me I was like this is just so disappointing <laughs> I loved the series as a whole number 18 is a poetry collection called believing is not the same as being saved by Lisa Merton this is like a good poetry collection and it's a lot about her father's early death when she was a child and it's also about uh her relationship with like her faith and losing her faith and understanding that relationship as she gets older it was good i liked it number 19 is golem girl by reva smith and this is a uh memoir um of reva who is a, a, dis a disabled artist and she talks a lot about um her childhood she was born with spina bifida and how she's had so many surgeries um growing up she also had a very complicated relationship with her mother which is explored in this book which i thought was probably the most powerful part of this book um really really complex and she does a really good job of kind of uh explaining those complexities or doing the best she can anyway and then uh there's lots of artwork in here so she's an artist who works with a bunch of different medium and mediums media 
Um, and I loved the artwork. That was the best part of this book for me. She's an amazing artist and she has a, she has a series of um, artworks about uh, people with disabilities and she showcases those in the book and talks about the process of making those and I really like that as well. So yeah, would recommend. Um, number 20 is a short story collection called Arid Dreams by, I can't remember the author and I can't remember the translator, so it's on the screen. It's translated from Thai and this was a gift from Jennifer Tibbetts, um, a friend of mine when we did like a big group chat uh, book exchange. Um, I don't remember when we did it. Anyway, I was the last person to read <laughs> their book from that. Of like 20 people, I was the last person to read it from that exchange. And I just finished it and I really liked it. It was a good short story collection. I think in any short story collection, there's of course going to be ones you like more than others. There's probably like three or four I thought were really excellent, like really strong stories that had some really, um, really interesting kind of messages or really interesting playing with form and stuff. I really liked that. When I say form, I mean like kind of uh, the way that they, the way that the story itself is kind of constructed throughout the, the piece is quite good. So the way that the narrative thread goes. So it's probably like four, I think it's probably four, four or five that I really, really liked. And there's some I didn't like very much at all. Um, but yeah, that's just the way all short story collections go. And I love it when this happens, but the title uh, short story, Arid Dreams, was my favorite story in the collection. So yeah, uh, overall quite good. Number 21 is Reservoir 13 by John McGregor. This was a reread for me. I actually listened to an audiobook. It's a book I've wanted to reread for years and I'm so glad I finally did and I really really loved it and I thought it might be a five-star read for me on the second time around and it wasn't um, but I'm glad I reread it because I, I needed to confirm that my original feelings were the same and they are <laughs> and I still think this book is quite masterfully shaped. It follows um, so the, the way it opens up is that there's this young girl who goes missing uh, it's in the north, it's some some small village in the north of England. Her family's there on vacation. She goes missing, and then each chapter kind of follows a full year of the townspeople and their life in this village. Um, village people. And I just think it's really smartly done. It's a really clever way of telling a story and I liked it a lot. 22 is Funny Boy by, oh I can't remember his name. It's on the screen. Um, I just read it for um, my book club and I really liked it. I did not anticipate liking it and I ended up really liking it. It is uh, a collection of short stories. Again, they're all connected because they have all the same characters or at least the same narrator all the way through which is the uh, you know the main character set in Sri Lanka in the 80s I believe the writing style is so straightforward that it, the writing is not the thing that really gets you but it is the narrative style I think that is is effective like having a child narrate a lot of these um adult relationships is great because you become the child because you are outside you don't understand these people and so you kind of get the child's perspective and I think it's really effective. Number 23, Swollening, a poetry collection by my friend Jason Purcell. This is a beautiful collection. A lot of the collection is about their own journey with queerness and then a lot of it's also about like um illness and particularly there's like some recurring images in this poetry collection I thought were really interesting like there's a lot of mentioned about teeth and fingers and there's like and hands and stuff and there's a lot of um like, there's also a huge part of it about climate change which I thought those poems were so smart and so um provocative because they use a lot of the imagery of illness um from the previous poems and then kind of puts it into this the um the story of climate change and our relationship with climate change and I thought it was really clever and quite effective so this is a great poetry collection would recommend picking it up Number 24, 10 Steps to Nanette. This is Hannah Gadsby's uh, memoir that just came out recently. And if you don't know Hannah Gadsby, uh, she has a um, like a <laughs> life-changing, um, genre-defining, uh, genre-destroying genre <laughs> stand-up comedy show called Nanette. And this book is her memoir talking about how Nanette came to be. And because Nanette is a culmination, it's a, it's a look at trauma. Um, Hannah Gadsby's life was a very, she had a very traumatic life in many ways. In some ways it was not, in some ways it was. And so she kind of talks about how all these, how, how who she is has led to the creation of Nanette. And I thought it was really effective. It's not a light memoir by any stretch of the imagination and it's not like super funny. Um, but I think it's probably one of the best comedian memoirs I've ever read because she's so smart and she really understands what she's doing with words and with language. Um, so yeah, I really, I thought it was really interesting and I'm glad I read it. Um, 25, um, oh, I have, so I have three in a row. The Searcher, Sunday Silence, Magpie Murders, 25, 26, 27. These are all kind of together. They're the three kind of murder mysteries, crime novels that I've read this year. 
Um, I genuinely think they were all really good. I liked them all. Um, the Searcher is by Tana French. Um, Sunday Silence is by Nikki French. And Magpie Murders is by Anthony Horowitz. I liked them all. They're all, you know, they all have different uh, elements that make them quite good, but they're all, you know, just... I, I love a crime novel and it gives me exactly what I need. These all three gave me exactly what I wanted when I read them, so they're quite good. A book I haven't talked about but I really want to, um, number 28, Satellite Love by Genki Ferguson. This is a Canadian book that I was like, I don't know why, but I was like 100% sure it was going to be on the Giller long list last year. It was not. And I hadn't read it, I just was sure it was going to be on there. I thought this book was so clever in what it's doing when with terms of identity and um, religion and about relationships with parents and about relationships with um, your peers and also kind of there's kind of the sci-fi element to the story which is really effective. I th I thought it was excellent like this book is one of the best Canadian books. It's a debut novel and it, it reads like a debut novel. It's not perfect. There's definitely some you know kind of hiccups here and there with the writing that I think are could be ironed out in the future but as a debut novel I thought the themes it explored were so smart. I thought the ending was so clever. I love this idea of um, this like it kind of looks at mental health in a really interesting way. I just thought it was so so good and I'm so angry that it wasn't recognized for for how good it is. I think maybe people read it a bit as like a maybe like as a YA book but it's not YA um, because the main characters are teenagers uh, and because there's a playfulness to the writing because one of the characters is a satellite dish. Um, is a fantastical element to it. But it is not. It is so smart and it is so um, complex and it is like dealing with really big, important, heavy things. And I thought it was excellent. I would highly recommend this book. I loved it. Number 29 is Small Things Like These by Claire. And then the name, the last name has completely escaped me. O'Keefe Keegan. Foster. Fuller? Don't know. It's on the screen. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this is like a a glorified novella. It's a short story that was that sold in, as a novella, which I'm still angry about. It's $27. Too much for a very small book. Anyway, it's a great short story. The story of a man who has um, a very, a very uh, lucky childhood in some ways, and then how he tries to pay that forward in his adulthood. And it's very good, and I recommend reading it. Number 30, Orwell's Roses by Rebecca Solnit. This is a book I talked about in my last video, which I'll leave a link to. This is an examination of George Orwell's relationship with the natural world um, ex as explored through his writing. And uh, I really, really enjoyed this book. There's a, there's a lot of tangents in this book. She talks a lot about roses, like historically, because it is about like a lot about his garden, which he had a very... Um, a very prominent rose garden and uh, I really appreciated what this book did in terms of she's I mean Rebecca Solnit I have to say is the kind of uh, literary analyst that I wish I could have been. Um, you know it's, there's section of this where she's doing some really amazing work kind of deconstructing what he's written and I was reading it like oh I wish I had done that in my thesis <laughs> because it's so much better than anything I've ever written. Um, so parts of this were excellent. This is a book I really engaged with. I did a lot of like writing in the margins. I did a lot of it took me a long time to read because I read it quite slowly, quite like closely. And um, yeah, it was a great reading experience. I do think there was it was a little bit tangential. So the book never fully formed for me as like a whole as a whole complete object. But um, yeah, I really I loved reading it. The process was great. So I um, would recommend that one. Now we're into my top 10. Uh, 31 Dream of a Woman by Casey Platt. This is a short story collection. Uh, it was shortlisted for the Giller. No, longlisted for the Giller. It should have been shortlisted for the Giller because it was better than the other ones that were shortlisted for the Giller. Um, it is, most of the stories are about trans characters. I think actually all of them are about trans characters. One thing I loved about this collection is some of the stories are broken up into sections so that you um, will take a break and revisit characters over and over and over again and kind of follow their life over many years and I thought that was really smart and I really liked it. I liked all the characters in here. I think every one of them was distinct and also very well developed. My favorite story is the last, second last one in the book where um, there's a character who returns back to their hometown after having transitioned and how being a different person in that space makes that space different. I thought it was great. So yeah, great short story collection and so easy to read. I flew through it. Great. I can't wait to read whatever else Casey Platt writes. Um, number 32, Severance by Ling Ma. This was a reread for me. I listened to an audio. I thought the narrator was excellent. This was a five-star read for me the first time around. Five-star read for me the second time around. I loved this book. Um, I think, <laughs> like, it's a hard book to read in the middle of a pandemic because it's about a pandemic. Um, but I still think that 
what it has to say about nostalgia and what it has to say about how we interact with the world around us in our present day is still you know unbelievably uh relevant and reflective and poignant to like my reality and i it's scary and excellent 33 is the lemon table by julian burns a short story collection that i loved i think every short story in this maybe not one of them i didn't like as much but most of them i absolutely loved for me as a julian burns fan this really distilled what makes his writing so excellent I actually think that might, this might be one of the best books of his I've ever read. Like I, I think he really shines in short stories. I loved, I loved almost everything in this book. Loved it. Recommend it to anyone. Uh, 34, Road Ends by Mary Lawson. I'm on a big Mary Lawson kick right now. I think she's amazing. This is a story of a, of a family uh, with like eight people in it. Uh, a mother who is kind of at like mentally absent. A father who is resentful about his entire life a son who's experienced some like an adult son who's experienced some severe trauma and is not handling it well and a daughter who is responsible for this whole family who just says peace out i want my own life and then how that all affects you know going forward it's amazing obsessed with mary lawson this book is incredible number 35 i reread empire of pain on audio by um patrick radicke i kind of forgot patrick radicke's name for a second i have a whole re review on this book which you can go and watch if you want to um but this book is exceptional it's perfection i don't know how it could be better um i even liked it i think i liked it better on audio i just say that because i think patrick radicke is an amazing narrator and i love hearing him read out his own words it was great an incredible book um yeah what else is to say about it go read it it's amazing these are my top five books of the year going from five to one uh or 36 to 40 sorry i have done this in a weird way <laughs> okay um 36 did you hear mammy died by seamus o'reilly this is a memoir about uh his own life where he had 11 siblings his mother died when he was just about six years old and then his father was left to raise 11 children on his own in northern ireland um his house was right on the border between northern ireland and ireland and it's about his childhood in the 90s um, in <laughs> in a, you know, war-torn Northern Ireland uh, without a mother and uh, a family that was hilarious and a father who uh, he adores. It is a love letter to his father. This book is funny. It is touching. It is really insightful in some ways. I loved it. An amazing reading experience. Would highly recommend. Number 37, Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel. I loved this book. Um, this is a pandemic book, kind of. Uh, a lot. Uh, it's, a, it's also a time travel book and I don't want to, this is the thing, is like, this is a hard book to talk about because if you haven't read Station Eleven and Glass Hotel by Emily St. John Mandel, a lot gets spoiled in Sea of Tranquility for you, but I also think you, like, if you don't care about the other two, you could read this book, but you should also read the other two first because they're incredible. Um, they're also both five-star reads for me. Loved them both. Um, yeah, this book is just amazing and I think that she is, Again, her writing has this power to like make me forget that I'm that I exist in a world outside of the one that she's written, and the way that the, she tie, kind of ties these ends up. I always find that like time travel novels are difficult to wrap up because uh, I, I like reading about time travel, but I also often feel like oh that's a cop out. And the way that she kind of like ties these knots, oh my glory, just genius. An amazing, amazing book. Then number three, number thirty eight <laughs> is Into Thin Air by John Krakauer. This is his memoir about hiking Mount Everest and um, the disaster that occurred, the tragedy that occurred when he, on his team while he was hiking. This is an older book. It's probably like published in the 90s and like I feel like everyone has read this book but I um, picked it up for the first time this year and man it's so good. He is an amazing writer just and he's a journalist as well so he has that kind of journalistic quality. What I liked most about this book was that it's not just about his own memoir of hiking um, Mount Everest but it's also about the, his, the history and the geography around Mount Everest and then like the um Himal is it Himalayas oh my gosh yes right uh, in general about that area of the world and about kind of the um the geopolitical things going on around that area and about like the the economics surrounding trying to hike um or how to try to climb Mount Everest and about like the phenomena like the cultural phenomena it's really really well done uh, an amazing amazing read uh, couldn't put it down like really 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 good in my top two books of the year <laughs> if you are still here watching one thank you but two you probably know what they are um my second best book of the year is the anthropocene reviewed by uh i was gonna say john seven four no by john green this is a collection of essays about the world we're currently living in it is a book that is incredibly full of hope it's a book that's that looks at a lot of things that are stressful and anxiety inducing and things that are we don't understand and that really are scary and then 
it provides these um, threads of hope, um, these threads of, of shining some light on these things that are quite difficult and, and really says that humanity is here for humanity. Like we exist to help each other. And uh, yeah, it's excellent. I love that book. It got me through a really rough period and uh, man, it's good. And my best book of the year, as I think I've already talked about in another video where I said the best book of 2022 is Run Toward the Danger by Sarah Polly. This is a collection of essays about her own experiences as a child actor, as a famous person, um, as, uh, as a young woman, and uh, about trauma she's experienced throughout her life, different, different forms of trauma, different um, things that have happened to her. And she is an adult now, she's in her 40s, she has, you know, three children and husband and she has a very successful career. And this book feels like a person who has put the work in, who has um, spent many years trying to process her trauma, trying to understand the layers of complexity around what has happened to her uh, in her childhood. And it's just perfection, like the writing is exceptional. And I think about this, like something I did, I don't know if I've, I said in that video very eloquently was that particularly the first essay, which is called Alex, Alice Collapsing, uh, which looks at her playing the role of Alice in Wonderland on stage at the Stratford Festival as a teenager. Um, that story told in conjunction with the story of her father uh, falling apart, collapsing, having a, you know, depression, a mental breakdown, uh, told at the same time as um, her own physical breakdown, she had, um, uh, what's it called? She had a curvature in her spine. So she, she was having some physical problems with her spine. These three elements are like woven together in this, in this incredible, um, just like, just in terms of writing, like the way it's told isn't, I don't know if I've ever read anything like it. Like it should win some kind of award as an essay by itself because it's so spectacularly written. Um, and the way that she plays with the story of Alice to then shape her own story it's just incredible. Like, I don't know if I've ever read a more cleverly crafted essay. It's just perfect. Like, I, there's nothing, like, there's nothing I would ever change about that essay. It just, it just, everything about it makes me jealous that she can write that way. Just perfection. Just the best book of the year. Absolutely loved it. You know, I never say this in my videos, but if you're here at the end and you haven't yet subscribed, why not? Go right ahead. You very clearly made it all the way to the end. Let me know in the comments down below uh, if you've read any of these books, how you feel about these books. Um, if you would disagree with me, please go right ahead and let me know. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you soon. Bye.